As you mentioned, I'm Colonel Tom Greco. I'm from South Florida, um, part of the Jacksonville District. Uh, our headquarters is up in Jacksonville. We have offices throughout the state. Uh, years ago, there was a decision made uh, to, to put an Army officer down uh, in South Florida with all the ecosystem restoration stuff going on. Uh, it, it's a wonderful assignment down there. I work out of West Palm Beach. Uh, but just want to spend just a, a few moments here talking about the Corps of Engineers, the Jacksonville District, uh, just, just for your knowledge. Um, the Jacksonville District has a, has a multitude of responsibilities, uh, predominantly with civil works, uh, and I'll talk about um, specific ones in the, in the upcoming slides here. Uh, we cover the state of Florida and basically the Caribbean with offices in Puerto Rico uh, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, we do uh, a great deal of work, obviously uh, federally authorized projects, uh, operations and maintenance, uh, and um, deal with a lot of uh, infrastructure uh, that has national significance. Um, just a little about Florida and our district. Uh, on one front, we have 900 miles of inland waterways, uh, the intercoastal, the Okeechobee waterway. Uh, we play a role in uh, maintaining those. Uh, we have the uh, largest regulatory program in the nation. Uh, I bring that up because, as you may know, our regulatory program to a uh, nearly exclusive, not exclusive, but to a large extent, uh, regulates uh, wetlands. And there are a lot of wetlands in Florida, so we get a lot of work. Uh, as I said, the, the, the highest amount in the, in the country. Uh, and we also have um, the largest ecosystem restoration program in the country. Uh, so a lot of stuff going on, uh, and I'm going to talk to you about some of those things today. Okay, so this isn't a history lesson, uh, but I do want to point out a few things here about the South Florida environment, the ecosystem. Okay, we all generally know the history of Florida. Uh, people back in the 1800s, consequently it was the military who first really mapped South Florida to any large extent, uh, and it was two military officers who recognized the potential for uh, utilizing the land in South Florida. Uh, I will point out though they were not engineers, it was a quartermaster and a cavalryman. <laughs> But nonetheless, throughout the, throughout the 1800s, uh, there was this development. There was a push to obviously uh, develop, and at the time, agriculture was, was the predominant thing in America. Uh, throughout a course of decades, uh, settlement continued in South Florida, because let's face it, South Florida is, is a great place to live. Now, during this settlement, a lot of goals were sought to be achieved to make settlement easier. Among those, uh, and I'm sure it was discussed a lot today, was drainage of the Everglades, or that the mantra of drain the Everglades, make the place suitable and habitable for people. Uh, and folks did a pretty good job at that. It started pr primarily with private interests uh, in the 1880s. Uh, and by 1926, a lot of the major flood control or drainage works, I should say, in South Florida were already established. Okay, Not the ones you see today as you drive through South Florida, but between private interests and the Everglades Drainage District, uh, the canal, uh, Lake Okeechobee was connected to the St. Lucie Estuary in the Clusahatchee, in the Clusahatchee. Uh, canals were dug there, and there are four major canals that were dug out of Lake Okeechobee. Uh, there are outlets uh, extending from Palm Beach all the way down to Miami. Uh, vestiges of all those canals exist today, certainly the St. Lucie and the Clusahatchee. Uh, but it, it's important to note out that a lot of these efforts uh, were done not necessarily in haste at the time, but certainly not with the knowledge that we have today. Uh, but we also know that in Florida, 1926, 1928, catastrophic hurricanes hit the state, predominantly around the Lake Okeechobee area. They were catastrophic not only in terms of damage to infrastructure, houses primarily, but it killed you know, upwards estimates of about 3,000 people. Uh, folks at that time realized that despite the best efforts to drain the Everglades, they realized that weather in South Florida was pretty fickle and something needed to be done to address these significant storm events and flooding. So it's in 1930, I don't have it up there, but 1930 where the federal government uh, was called on to take action and create a, uh, a, better system, a better way to control specifically the waters around Lake Okeechobee. That initial authorization in 1930 uh, under the Rivers and Harbors Act ultimately led to the Lake Okeechobee and Clusahatchee River drainage area at, or project. Uh, that include, included about 68 miles of levees on the south side of Lake Okeechobee, about 14 miles on the north side, and at the time, an improvement to the Clusahatchee Canal and River. Um, that was the Corps' first involvement uh, in, in uh, in what we know today as the Central and Southern Florida Project. But as time went on through the 1930s and part of the 1940s, 
weather took another turn. It was very dry. And during that time, what people started realizing, and they saw it through things like muck fires, the ground basically going on fire, oxidizing, what they noticed is they started to do such a very good job at draining the system that it was having significant effects on the landscape. Uh, and that really came to bear in 1947 with catastrophic hurricanes once again, where most of South Florida was flooded for a series of months. Uh, again, the federal government was called on to take action, uh, and ultimately what happened in 1948 was the Central and Southern Florida Project. I'm going to talk about the Central and Fl Southern Florida Project a little uh, this afternoon, but basically this was an extensive pro uh, project to address the concerns that folks had based on a lot of experiences they had over several decades. Uh, and it was really the first attempt to uh, engineer and manage the system on a very large scale. I'm going to briefly talk about that time period between 1948 and the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Program in 2000, uh, just to set up some context. Okay, so the Central and Southern Florida Project. Interesting project. It's an engineering mar marvel. As a matter of fact, it, it's got about 900 uh, or about 2,000 miles worth of levees and canals, a uh, uh, great many structures, uh, which I'll talk about on the, on the next slide. Uh, but this has resulted, I was talking about some of the things about the Jacksonville District before, it amounts to the second largest of um, levees and canals in the, in the U.S. Uh, so it's a very extensive project. It covers an area of 18,000 square miles. Uh, to put that in perspective, it's about two and a half times the size of New Jersey. Uh, and its intent and its goals are listed there on the, left, on the left. Those original project purposes, what did it seek to accomplish? Flood control, certainly. Based on the hurricanes, the extensive flooding, that was really one of the primary objectives that folks wanted to see addressed. Drainage and water control, yes, there was still an effort to ensure that there was a degree of drainage uh, so, that it, so that several purposes could be met in the state, primarily for economic reasons, but also for development, because let's face it, at that time, uh, Florida was really starting to uh, expect it to, to grow over the course of the next uh, several decades, and, and it has. It outpaced those expect expectations. Groundwater recharge, again, problems with the aquifers, groundwater getting too low. Uh, water supply uh, between agriculture and municipalities, there was a need in many cases for drinking water, uh, but also for things like irrigation. Prevention of saltwater intrusion, again, that's where the groundwater comes into play. Uh, there were problems with the groundwater going too low because of the over drainage, and there were issues with saltwater seeping into the aquifers. Uh, navigation, navigation is a purpose primarily on the Okeechobee waterway. Uh, fish, and fish and wildlife pres preservation. Uh, people realized at the time, given the nature of the system that was built, there was some type of harmful effect on the ecology, the health of the system with respect to flora and fauna. Uh, there were steps taken to address this. And finally, recreation. That was one of the uh, stated goals of the original project. Uh, and over the course of years, there are several different authorizations by Congress, uh, which ultimately led to the inclusion of ecosystem restoration as a project purpose. Now, to talk about some of this stuff, uh, you, you could spend hours upon hours kind of explaining the rationale behind all of this. Um, but ultimately, what was sought was to balance as best as possible a system, the system that people knew at the time. However, again, uh, what we knew at the time is not necessarily what we know today. Today, though, just some uh, statistics on the system itself. Uh, it, like I said, it is huge. Uh, 2,000 miles of levees and canals, lots of structures, uh, and lots of pumping. What this is intended to illustrate is that, again, this is a highly managed system. You could essentially move water almost anywhere you want, but the challenge is you can't for a variety of reasons, uh, which I'll discuss. But the key features of this really are Lake Okeechobee, uh, right in the center of the state, uh, and south of it, you have the Everglades Agricultural Area. Uh, one of the project purposes was to provide uh, flood control for that area to, to uh, provide for economic development. South of that, the blue areas are the water conservation areas. Those water, water conservation areas were recognized as a need back in 1948 uh, because of that over drainage. Those canals that extended from Lake Okeechobee on the south side down to Palm Beach and, um, and Miami. They realized there was a significant degree of over drainage there. These water conservation areas are basically impoundments, they're reservoirs. Uh, originally, those are the terms used in the original documentation. Uh, and they were intended basically to hold water, uh, provide for groundwater recharge, and ensure the area wasn't, wasn't over drained. Uh, and this was also consequently an area where they really looked at 
uh, fish and wildlife benefits. And then, of course, to the far south is Everglades National Park, which was authorized as a park in 1947. Uh, so again, a very extensive and highly managed system, uh, but as we know, uh, it's had some serious challenges over the last several decades, uh, while also working uh, rather well under many circumstances. So what did we start seeing between 1948 and 2000? Because uh, ultimately what I'm going to lead to is the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Program, which is the federal government's and the state's uh, commitment to restoring what remained of the Everglades. Uh, but these are the things that people saw. Uh, declining estuary health. Uh, we, we heard in, in the presentation right after lunch, uh, it's no secret that the discharges from Lake Okeechobee and the basins have a significant harmful effect on the estuaries. Uh, that was noticed uh, many, many decades ago, uh, and depending on the type of rainfall you get there in a particular uh, season, it, it's exacerbated. So that is one of the goals at, or one of the things that uh, was identified as a problem and something being sought to, uh, that we're seeking to fix. Soil oxidation, muck fires, uh, and the loss of sawgrass ridges, tree islands, and sloughs, indicators of the health of the ecosystem. Uh, you could see very plainly by the naked eye that there were issues with it. Uh, loss of tree islands and sawgrass ridges, uh, again, in the Rendon Everglades, there were a lot of issues with just the basic topography, the ecology, uh, and how the system responded to the, uh, to the effects of water management. Uh, subsidence, uh, primarily in the agricultural areas, uh, the ground was essentially disappearing, uh, and that was due very often to too dry conditions. And finally, declining Everglades and Florida Bay habitat. Uh, people realized that the water was just not right in South Florida, and we all know that today. When it's wet, it's wet in the wrong places, and when it's dry, it's dry everywhere. So how do you strike a balance and get to a point uh, for some degree uh, of balance throughout the entire ecosystem? And I want to point out that the ecosystem includes all of us, and that's how it's viewed uh, based on uh, given the nature of comprehensive Everglades restoration. But if you look on the left side, you can see kind of what has happened over the course of time. The top graphic is, uh, is a depiction of the, remnant Everglades, of, of the original Everglades, and you can see how extensively it, it was throughout uh, South Florida. Starting in the Kissimmee Basin, where waters would flood during the wet season and slowly trickle down into Lake Okeechobee uh, over the course of the dry season and, of course, part of the wet season. Uh, but the intent there was that it would overflow the base, the southern rim of Lake Okeechobee, and find its way south, down through the Everglades, and ultimately to Florida Bay. Given the changes that were begun in the 1880s by private and, and local and state interests, and really uh, expanded upon in earnest by the federal government in the 40s, uh, you could see on the bottom the effects of the managed system. And those effects are pretty apparent in terms of where the water goes, how it's routed, uh, and the impacts it may have on certain parts of the ecosystem. So in a moment, I'm going to talk about what's being done to, to fix that. The primary catalyst uh, from an authorization standpoint is the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Program. Uh, this plan was a seminal plan, a key piece of environmental legislation, the biggest restoration program uh, that was authorized by Congress, uh, at the time the biggest in the world. Uh, pretty significant achievement. Uh, culminating in, in many, many years of study uh, and certainly um, uh, requests and, and impetus from the public and people like you to do something about the ecosystem to restore it, maybe not to what it was 200 years ago, 4,000 years ago, but to make the most of what we have remaining. Now, I want to point out that bottom paragraph there, which is verbiage taken directly from the authorization. It's a program providing for the restoration, preservation, and protection of the South Florida ecosystem. So we know we ultimately want to restore it, but while we're restoring it, we do need to preserve what we have, and that takes into account current management practices and doing everything possible uh, to uh, mitigate for harmful effects on the ecosystem. And of course, protect it. Take all measures to ensure that we don't lose any of the benefits that we've gained over the course of time while providing for other water-related needs of the region. And those include things like water supply and flood control. There is still an expectation, a need, and an author or a mandate by Congress to provide for those things, uh, those project purposes that I had a couple slides back. So the tricky part here is balancing all of that, restoring the ecosystem while still ensuring that people can flourish and thrive uh, in their communities economically, socially, 
uh, and politically. Uh, it's a very significant challenge and one that we've seen played out uh, at least over the, over, the past of the la uh, over the past decade and a half. So this is the goal. I already showed you the, the two on the left, uh, what it used to look like, what it currently looks like, and the goal on the right, the restored flow, and again, these are just schematics, the restored flow on the, on the right is to bring some semblance back to what the Kissimmee River used to look like, uh, creating some type of floodplain. Uh, the purpose there is to improve the ecology right on the floodplain, but also to change the timing of flows into Lake Okeechobee because water right now barrels straight down the Kissimmee River into Lake Okeechobee. The other goal is to reduce the amount of discharges that go west and east. Uh, again, we know during the summer that's very harmful to the estuaries. Uh, it only makes sense that it should go south. Uh, and that's the ultimate goal of, of restoration is to put more water in the southern part of the system, the Remnant Everglades, where it's needed and most desperately wanted now. I'm just gonna build this out real quick. Um, so what's actually being done? Well, a lot of construction projects. Uh, and I'll talk about sort of the program and how all this stuff fits together in a moment. Uh, but this has been a long-standing effort, but it wasn't always the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Program. There are a few things in yellow that we call the foundation projects. These were projects that were authorized as early as the, uh, as the late 1980s uh, that were intended to provide benefits to South Florida uh, and the ecosystem. They weren't part of the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Program. They were targeted on specific uh, areas, in, in this case the Kissimmee River, uh, looking at uh, Seminole Big Cypress, the modified water deliveries, and C-111 South Dade. Uh, what those projects are in particular is sort of irrelevant, but what people found over the course of time is that there was no concerted effort to really tackle the problem from a strategic standpoint and create a framework to deal with the ecosystem in its entirety. So that's where SERP came in, and SERP authorized in 2000, went through extensive planning, uh, and planning is very extensive, it came up with the first batch of projects, those first generation SERP projects, which are outlined in blue. Picayune Strand, uh, Indian River Lagoon South, the C44 Reservoir and STA, uh, stormwater treatment area, Site 1 impoundment, and the C111 Spreader Canal. Uh, the, the first generation projects are all currently under construction. Now, mind you, for us, the Corps, to be able to turn dirt on any of these projects requires an authorization from Congress. Uh, so that's something that, that comes through the Water Resources Development Act. Uh, it used to be every two years. Now, at least for the last 15 years, it's been every seven years. Uh, so those projects are under construction right now. Recently in May, Congress passed another Water Resources Development Act uh, authorizing what we call the second generation of comprehensive Everglades restoration. Uh, and, and those are uh, several other projects out there, the C-43 Reservoir, Broward County Water Preserve Areas, uh, Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands, and um, I always, the, the C-111 Spreader Canal, I think I said that twice. Uh, but that's a second generation project. Now, we can't start doing work on those projects, even the final planning, engineering, and design until we get an appropriation by Congress. Um, but the other thing that you should take note of here, if you look at it just from a map spatial standpoint, you could see that a lot of work that has been done, either construction-wise or planning-wise, is on the periphery of the Remnant Everglades. Uh, the thinking there uh, was influenced by many factors, but really the conditions had to be set to allow more water to flow down south through the central portion of the Everglades. Uh, and from a planning standpoint, uh, we're certainly at the point where that can start, given that all those get constructed out. And that is represented by the Central Everglades Planning Project, uh, which is still in the final portions of its uh, planning. Uh, we expect to have a final report by the, by the end of this summer. But the Central Everglades Planning Project is really the first project that puts more water into the Remnant Everglades. Uh, we've been at this collectively for decades. Uh, and it might come to you as a shock that this is the first time more water is being introduced into the Remnant Everglades when it gets constructed. Um, but as I said, the conditions had to be set to get to this point, uh, and we're completing up that planning process uh, right now. But that is a seminal event uh, if it does get authorized by Congress in Everglades restoration, because that water that goes down south is going to ultimately come from Lake Okeechobee. Not all of it, though. 
Now the restoration program, I put this up here just to kind of give you some context and some idea about how it works. On the right, those bullets over there are essentially the program itself, what it consists of day to day on the ground, what does it take to get a project from idea to completion. But on the left, those are really the inputs, the things that I want to convey to you uh, and talk about for a few minutes, the things that influence what we do. First are federal sta and state laws and regulations. I also should have put up their litigation because that plays a, a huge role in, in what we do and, and that's a reality of it. Uh, but everything we do must be authorized by Congress. Uh, and so, of course, uh, you know, congressional, the, the, the ability of Congress to produce legislation, particularly those Water Resources Development Acts, is, is vitally important to us. Other projects. This is sometimes about trade-offs. Other projects, they could be anything. For us, it could be a navigation project, it could be a, um, a shore protection project, or any one of the other things that we do, or for the state, it could be any one of the other wide range of things they have responsibility for. But ultimately, you have finite resources, and as an organization, need to make decisions on how you tackle those resources. We do our best, and the state does their best, to try and do everything um, as quickly as humanly possible. But the way we plan, the way we look at the out years, is really based on the entire workload of everything else that's going on. Of course, funding's very important. We can't do anything without money. Uh, what we'll find over the years is uh, sometimes our money doesn't match up with the state money in terms of flow. Um, because for all of our projects, we need a sponsor. The Corps of Engineers re requires a sponsor at the non-federal level uh, to, to take on that project. And in our case, Comprehensive Everglades Restoration, that's the South Florida Water Management District, who's a great project sp uh, sponsor uh, and a great partner. Uh, but the thing I want to point out here is that it's a, in this case, it's a 50-50 cost share. So they pay 50% of the cost of these projects and we pay 50% of the cost of the projects. So it's, it's a true partnership. And like anything else, like a marriage, you need to make that work. Uh, and sometimes that could be difficult based on a variety of reasons, uh, not, uh, the least of which are things like funding streams uh, and priorities. Of course, stakeholder support is also critically important. Uh, we can't do anything unless people want it. Now, not everybody has to want it, but unless we have key agencies on board uh, with the intent of moving forward with projects or at least planning them, uh, successful success will not be found. So what we spend a lot of time doing is talking to stakeholders, talking to partners to see uh, where, what direction we need to move in. Uh, and we do that jointly with regard to restoration with the Water Management District. Uh, but one thing we found over the years is, is that if you don't have a broad base of support to at least tackle the problem and go through the planning process, then it will not succeed. Uh, so one thing we try to do is, is bolster stakeholder support as much as possible. And of course, authorize project purposes. We can't go beyond what Congress allows us to do. They may authorize us to build X project uh, but that project still has to be within the purposes they say it has to be, uh, whether it's ecosystem restoration or flood control. So on the right, you can see what we do to get from project to implementation, um, from project idea to implementation, and that basically includes a lot of planning, uh, construction, engineering, and design. These are the key parts, because this is what makes the concept a reality. But once it becomes a reality and it gets constructed, we also have a lot of other things that we do uh, throughout the entire project lifespan to ensure that it achieves the goals that it's supposed to achieve. That's everything from program controls like the budget and, and certain oversight mechanisms uh, down to dealing with our partners and sponsors to make sure that uh, operations and maintenance is done uh, the way it's supposed to be done, but also weaving science through the entire process because this really is a science-based endeavor uh, and it needs to be informed as such. So we put a lot of effort into that uh, and into getting feedback from the entire process. Here's a look at just some of the work that's going on, what's specifically been done, um, in this case, within the past year. A few things. One of the first generation projects was, the Mel was Melaleuca eradication. Uh, one relatively small project uh, in comparison to a lot of other things that have been done uh, was an eradication facility down in Davie, Florida. Pretty interesting place because what it, it, what it does is, is it basically rears uh, bugs to fight invasive plants. Um, on the right, contract one, the intake in C-133, C-133A canals. This is part of the Indian River Lagoon South Project, the C-44 Reservoir and Stormwater Treatment Area. 
Uh, there are still two other contracts to include the reservoir itself and the stormwater treatment area, but that was recently completed a couple weeks ago. Uh, and on the bottom are a few other projects in the southern part of the system. Uh, one of the, the cooler ones is the Tamiami Trail Bridge um, across Tamiami Trail about um, a, a couple miles west of Chrome Avenue. Uh, if you may recall, Tamiami Trail was built across the Everglades back in 1928, uh, and that essentially created a dam between everything north and everything south, and it's had a significant impact on Everglades National Park ever since. Okay, here's some, and I like really talking about this one. Uh, this is a specific project. I talked about the Kissimmee River before, and uh, you know where it is, but when we talk about restoration, a lot of people sometimes lose their faith in restoration because it takes a long time. We know that. They're hard to plan. We know that. The money is not always there. We know that. But the Kissimmee River Restoration Project is really a poster child for what restoration can actually do. Now, this here on the left really just describes what's been done so far in terms of contracts, in terms of work. Uh, ultimately, what we're trying to do is restore these segments of the river um, down there. You could see on the right benefits that have already been, been observed over the, over the past couple of years. Ecological response is happening within the Kissimmee River Basin now, and that's a result of the work that's been done because the Kissimmee River was channelized years ago, and the goal with this project now is to restore the oxbows in it so that you could create a floodplain and slow down the water uh, going, into the, uh, going into Lake Okeechobee. This is sort of a better view of what's going on, and I always regret that you can't see this side of the picture better, but what you see here is the old canal, and if you look really closely, you can see the oxbows meandering around, okay? This is a picture of what it looks like and what happened. You had the original canal there, uh, and basically what we did was fill that canal in and restore the connection between all these oxbows, which were still there, uh, but restore that connection. And the ultimate goal is what you see on the right, is a flooded, uh, is a flooded floodplain. And the results are apparent, you know, the return of birds um, and a lot of other ecological responses within the system there. Another project, the Picayune Strand Restoration Project down in Collier County, this is a great example of restoring wetlands. 55,000 acres that was originally intended to be developed, uh, but that development sort of um, fell out, uh, but they got, the developer got as far as putting a series of roads in and doing a very good job at draining the area. This project is going to restore uh, the, the ecological conditions that existed before. What we're physically doing is we're putting some pump stations in, we're removing a lot of the roads there, and the, all these yellow things on, the, on the, um, the map itself are plugs. We're plugging up the canal so that we can restore some level of sheet flow or, or water base within the area there. Uh, again, another great project coming along very well, uh, and we've already seen with that ecological benefits as well. And then finally, down in the southern part of the system, another key project is the modified waters deliveries to modified water deliveries to Everglades National Park. This pr this project was authorized in 1989, uh, so it's been going on a long time. We're we're close to completion, uh, but the the, pro the goal of this project is to take more water and actually send it down into Northeast Shark River Slough here, Everglades National Park. What you may be amazed at is even today there are restrictions on how much water can go into this part of the system. Uh, one of the key goals that we have is to get water down into the Everglades where it belongs. And then finally, I'm just going to end on this slide, uh, talking about science real quick. Uh, we have a program, it's an interagency program, collaboration between uh, the agencies that you see up there, and it's attended and informed by people like you as well. Uh, the response uh, coordination and verification team, uh, RECOVER, they are the science arm of ecosystem restoration. It's a programmatic uh, aspect of the, the broader program. Their job is to assess how well the system's responding to uh, the construction that's going on and, and all the work that's being done with respect to the Everglades. This is one thing I would encourage you to go to uh, the website for the Everglades restoration, and that's evergladesplan.org, and take a look at some of their products. Just this past Monday, they released the system status report which is basically the ecological uh, report card for uh, how Everglades restoration is doing. 
I'll be upfront with you. Uh, you won't see significant changes and, and some aha moment with restoration. Uh, it does identify improvements in many areas and the potential for uh, increased improvement in others. But there's still a lot of work to be done construction wise uh, and basically the way the water is managed uh, given those construction projects. So with groups like this uh, and a wide range of other stakeholders, we certainly uh, are committed to making sure that these projects do go forward, they get finished, uh, and that we continue planning and coordinating and putting the resources into uh, making this important program happen. And with that, I'll just leave uh, our district website, which has links to a lot of these things, uh, and just some, um, just a snapshot of all the other stuff that we do. Uh, I'm not sure how much time I have left, but I think about five minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody have a question? <laughs> Pete. Tom, what's the, uh, what's the risk of failure of the dike and what's the prognostication for getting it uh, up to good standards? Well, uh, so Herbert Hoover Dike is a, um, uh, a very important project and it does have problems. Uh, the risk, uh, right now we're finishing up a, a risk assessment for the dike itself. One was done years ago. Um, this one for a variety of reasons to include changes in, in dam standards throughout the U.S. Uh, is just sort of being um, redone uh, and quantified a little differently. But there is, there is a risk. I won't give a number because I don't physically have it for you right now. But there is a risk to Herbert Hoover Dyke. It's an aging dike. As you remember, 68 miles were first built on the southern portion, 14 miles on the northern portion. With the Central and Southern Florida Project, 143 miles was built to encircle the lake. Um, 68 plus 14 of those 143 miles were built on the old levees. Uh, so that, as we've seen over the course of time, at the time it was an accepted practice. Uh, we've realized over the course of time, not so much, and certainly other parts of the dike have had pressures exerted upon them um, to the point where there, there has been recognized the fact that it, it is at, at risk and needs a tremendous amount of work. Right now what we're doing, uh, in 2012 we finished putting in a seepage barrier on the southeast corner, on the southeast side of the lake, and we're currently going through the process of replacing 32 federal culverts uh, around the dike because those what we've seen and when I talk about risk and problems with the dike what you physically see with any earthen levee system is seepage water flowing through it that's that's normal you have a problem when you see water flowing through it with sediment pieces of the earthen levee itself and that's what's been happening over the last couple decades uh, in response to that we're going through this construction or this rehabilitation process and um, We've also taken other measures. We've lowered, we've lowered Lake, the Lake Okeechobee regulation schedule, keep it a little lower, um, and uh, you know, some other actions to, to remediate for or mitigate the risk associated with the dike. Now, there's still some work to do. I mentioned we, we did a cutoff wall. That was about 22 miles out of the 143. That's not to say all 143 miles needs a cutoff wall. We've done that. We're working on the 32 culverts. Uh, this fall, we'll roll out a recommended plan on how to deal with the remaining 120 miles of earthen embankment if they do need attention. Yes, ma'am. Um, core um, regulations restricted to navigable waterways, is that right? Uh, waters of the United States, yes. I, I am not an expert on the regulatory aspect, but no, not just navigable. It's, um, okay. it's, it's waters of the U.S., and that actually has a lot of attention right now because the EPA is going through a rulemaking process to further define the, or give more clarity to it. That was going to be my yeah. question is what size? Yeah, it's, it just varies. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So projections for sea level rise and how they're affecting planning for Everglades projects. So I can say with the comprehensive Everglades restoration program projects, sea level rise is taken into account. Um, now what you could imagine is when that system was built in 1948, sea level rise was not a consideration. Uh, that's a huge topic of discussion right now. I can say there are no plans to change structures 
um, in total, but uh, you know, we're, we're talking right now, we, you know, within the next few years, we have to go back and really take a close look at the impacts of sea level rise over the last 60 years uh, to see if there has been an impact and if anything needs to change, especially with respect to the coastal structures, of which there's a lot. All right. Well, I appreciate your time. Oh, I'm sorry. There was so one of the there was a pilot there was a project and also a pilot project. Uh, I think you might be referring to a seepage barrier. Yes. Yeah, and that seepage barrier is on the northeast corner of Everglades National Park. Uh, it, for reasons that would take a long time to explain, that pilot project fell through. But uh, there's a there's mining going on just to the east of here, and one of their mitigation measures. Uh, for mining under the core permit process. Uh, they're actually, they've put in a couple miles worth of seepage barrier here uh, with plans to put more in pending approval. And that's the, and the problem up here is there's seepage from here to the east and that's what that's supposed to solve. Yeah. Well, th that's um, you know kind of always been a problem, and the way that we manage for it now is through the water management plan that we have. You know what dictates when levers are pulled and gates are opened and stuff like that, um, and it, it's, it's simply a, a balancing act. And we work closely with the Fish and Wildlife Service, with FWC, a, a wide range of stakeholders. Each year, as we go through the water planning process on on how stages, particularly in water conservation area three, are managed, uh, to make sure that we we do. Um, ideally, no harm to, to especially the endangered species in there. 